Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sarma Melangalis and Anthony Strangis? This case was the topic of a Netflix documentary titled Bad Vegan Fame Fraud Fugitives. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. Sarma Melangalis was born in Latvia on September 10, 1972. She grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. Her father was a physicist at MIT, and her mother was a chef. In 1994, Sarma graduated from University of Pennsylvania with a bachelor's degree in economics. She moved to New York City and worked for investment firms. But in 1998, she decided to change careers. She wanted to become a chef. In 1999, she graduated from the French Culinary Institute. Sarma was romantically involved with a chef named Matthew Kenny. The couple opened a restaurant in 2001, but it closed two years later. Sarma then worked as a consultant for an investor. In 2004, Sarma, Matthew, and the investor opened a restaurant called Pure Food and Wine in New York City. It served raw food. They opened a retail store not long after this called One Lucky Duck Juice and Takeaway. This place sold food prepared and packaged from the restaurant, along with other items like supplements, clothing, and books. By 2009, the relationship between Sarma and Matthew had failed. The investor kicked Matthew out of the partnership and gave Sarma a $2.1 million loan to buy the two businesses. Sarma continued to run the businesses and opened another retail store location. She was successful, but lonely. She had a pit bull named Leon, but didn't really have any romantic connections. Sarma felt as though she missed her chance to be romantically involved with Alec Baldwin, who was just one of the many celebrities who visited her business. Alec Baldwin ended up meeting his future wife, Hilaria, at Sarma's restaurant. The documentary didn't offer any specifics about how they met, but I picture Alec walking up to Hilaria and introducing himself as she was eating vegan gazpacho and reading the novel Don Quixote. Either way, Sarma may have felt more desperate about her chances of finding love, so in 2011 she started communicating with a man online who called himself Shane Fox. His real name was Anthony Strangis. He was born in Massachusetts in 1981. He had been married to a woman named Stacy. They lived in Tampa, Florida in 2004. According to Stacy, Anthony had told her a number of lies. For example, his aunt left him $5 million, demons were chasing him, he was a Navy SEAL, and they were reincarnated lovers who found each other through time. One day, out of the blue, Anthony left and never returned. I guess he could always find another lover when he is reincarnated. It's not clear if Sarma was aware that Anthony was a reincarnated Navy SEAL demon magnet. When Sarma first met Anthony in person, she was surprised by how he was heavier than she thought he would be, like he was not being truthful about his weight. The employees at the restaurant did not like Anthony, and they thought that his relationship with Sarma was weird, almost like the two were not well matched. Anthony made a number of extraordinary claims to Sarma. He said that he was involved in black ops. He claimed he had an assistant and a driver. He said he drove a Bentley. And he had what appeared to be diamonds in his possession. Anthony lived in Massachusetts and had sporadic contact with Sarma through the early days of their relationship. He would occasionally ask for thousands of dollars, which Sarma would give him. The restaurant employees eventually figured out that Shane's real name was Anthony Strangis. They told Sarma, but she didn't react, like she didn't care. Eventually, Sarma and Anthony broke up, but they reunited not long after this. The couple started looking at houses. One of them was priced at $15 million. They started the process of purchasing the house. Anthony told the broker that he was worth millions of dollars. They worked out this whole deal for the purchase but the money never showed up. Perhaps the demons caught up with Anthony and took it. By this point, Sarma was behind on her payments to the investor. 
Anthony told her that he could pay off the $2 million that she owed. The couple married in November of 2012. It's not really clear why they needed to. Anthony made a number of unusual statements and promises to Sarma. He said that she was now protected by the government. Again, he was supposed to be some type of elite combat operator. He put her in touch with an IT guy, ostensibly from some top secret organization. The guy needed her passwords to keep her safe. As it turns out, this IT guy was actually Anthony. Anthony told Sarma that he had been alive before. He had been reincarnated several times. In a past life, he had a past version of her dog, Leon. Anthony had been searching for Sarma throughout many lifetimes. He was her destiny. If Sarma followed his plan, like if he trusted in their love without question and passed a number of tests, he would make her and her dog immortal. All of them would live in utopia for eternity. Eventually, she would become a queen and change physical form in order to enter a house. I assume the house was in a utopian neighborhood. Sarma's first test was to wire him money, which she did. At this time, Sarma was doing well financially. Her company had $7 million in gross sales per year, and she had over $600,000 in the bank. Anthony would hang around at the restaurant. He acted like he owned it, which aggravated the employees. He would often travel and make up stories as to his location, like he was in Africa fighting rebels. Anthony said he had a brother who could see everything. This brother could tell if Sarma was disobeying Anthony's commands. All these requests that he was making of Sarma were to test her faith. It was a trial by fire and was designed to make her doubt Anthony. Anthony started gaining weight. Sarma was even more displeased than she was initially about his physical appearance. He said that this was intentional. Sarma was supposed to be disgusted. Sarma kept giving Anthony money that he requested. From 2012 to 2014, she gave him $1.7 million. Sarma borrowed money from various people in order to keep paying Anthony. Her financial situation was becoming desperate. After Sarma and Anthony traveled to Paris in 2014, the restaurant payroll checks bounced and the business closed. Sarma managed to raise more investment money to reopen the restaurant. The employees came back. Anthony made it seem as though this was always the plan. Sarma was able to open the business again because she listened to him. In 2015, Anthony used the alias Michael Caledonia and pretended he was an investor. He set up several meetings with the investor in Sarma's restaurant, but he never showed up. In the spring of 2015, Anthony and Sarma went on the run. The restaurant closed again because the employees were not being paid. Anthony and Sarma ended up spending 10 months in Las Vegas, where Anthony gambled excessively. They drove back to New York City to borrow some more money from one of Sarma's friends before driving to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee in 2016. Sarma's investors contacted the authorities and charges were filed against both Sarma and Anthony. The police in Tennessee found them after they used a credit card at a Domino's Pizza. They were extradited to New York City to face charges. The couple had stolen more than $2 million from investors. Anthony pleaded guilty to four counts of grand larceny in the fourth degree and was sentenced to one year in jail and five years of probation. Sarma pleaded guilty to second degree grand larceny, criminal tax fraud, and first degree scheme to defraud. She was sentenced to four months in jail and five years of probation. Sarma filed for divorce in May of 2018. I guess she put her shape-shifting utopian queen plans on hold. Now moving to my analysis. One of the major questions in this case is this. Was Sarma a victim or a perpetrator? It's easy to watch the documentary and go back and forth on the answer to this question. Sometimes Sarma seems confused and gullible. At other times, she appears to have a criminal state of mind. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Sarma was under Anthony's control, like some type of mind control we might see with a cult or with Stockholm Syndrome. I will start with the supporting factors. In the documentary, Sarma makes references that suggest Anthony was pressuring her to do something sexual in nature. She never really spelled it out clearly, but there is that subtle reference. If that was happening, it would be consistent with narcissistic manipulation. 
Anthony made a number of bizarre and false claims. He was never any type of combat operative. The closest he ever came was when he was arrested for impersonating a police officer. He talked about how they had been reincarnated and found each other throughout time. This is remarkably similar to the beliefs of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, who were definitely not good role models for a healthy relationship. Anthony promised eternal life for Sarma and her dog. He made it seem as though his brother was always watching. There was a danger for Sarma if she didn't pass the money transfer tests. Anthony lied to Sarma to get access to her online credentials and passwords. There is the sense that Anthony was really exploiting Sarma's belief in magic. This type of fantastical thinking is not unheard of among vegans. For example, they tend to think of animals as more like human beings. Some argue this is based on experiencing feelings of inappropriate guilt. They have this sense that they're doing something wrong, so they look around to find something that they can feel guilty about. Perhaps Sarma was vulnerable to this feeling. If Anthony and Sarma were in a healthy relationship, why did Anthony need to lie to her repeatedly? In addition, these statements are consistent with narcissism, which is associated with manipulative behavior. Anthony appeared to have a gambling problem, and Sarma did not. She didn't really seem to benefit at all from the fraud or from her relationship with Anthony. He was simply using Sarma to get money for gambling. This makes Sarma seem less like a conspirator and more like a victim. Sarma was successful before she met Anthony. She wanted to be free from her investor, but she really didn't need to be. It was a preference. Her behavior drastically changed after meeting Anthony, which is consistent with some type of manipulation. Now moving to the factors that contradict the mind control theory. Anthony never kidnapped Sarma. There was no use of physical force. She had the opportunity and ability to leave anytime she wanted. Anthony's defense attorneys denied he ever used manipulation. Sarma made an effort to disguise her identity when the two fled in the spring of 2015. For example, she used an alias and she covered the duck tattoo on her arm using bandages. The communication between Anthony and Sarma was very shallow. In listening to the recordings in the documentary, it almost seems like parallel communication. This is when people talk to one another without making any connection. There is no true dialogue. It's just one person saying one thing and another person saying something else. But neither party is listening to the other. Neither person builds on or comments on what the other person said. This makes it seem like Anthony really didn't have an effect on Sarma because she really wasn't listening anyway. Sarma pleaded guilty to three felonies. She acknowledged that she committed the crimes. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Sarma was a victim or a perpetrator? I think she was mostly a victim. She definitely engaged in deliberate and harmful behavior, but it was Anthony that kept this fraud alive through his repeated deceptive behavior and subtle threats that mysterious government agents were watching. Did Sarma deserve to be convicted in this case? Yes. Even though I believe she was mostly a victim, there must be limits as to how much can be forgiven based on gullibility. What if Anthony had told her to murder somebody? What if he told her to rob a bank? Sarma knew the difference between right and wrong. I don't think she needed to be convicted of felonies, but she should have been held partially responsible. With all this in mind, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Sarma was not particularly good at business, but she was able to attract investors and employees because she had an unusual restaurant idea and she was physically attractive. When she met Anthony, he activated her world of fantasy. He spoke her language of nonsense. She wanted to live forever. She wanted to be a shape-shifting queen of utopia. She was okay with subjecting her poor dog to the misery of living with her eternally. She was so determined to achieve her goals that she disregarded major warning signs, like the fact that Anthony was requesting hundreds of thousands of dollars from her. This entire time, Anthony was nothing but a con artist. He had a gambling problem. Sarma wanted to keep the dream alive. Anthony wanted to gamble. They both achieved their goals, at least for a while. There are two more items I want to talk about in this case. 
Item number one is the nature of excessive gambling. Some people believe that this case involved a gambling addiction. I don't know if it did or it didn't, but it certainly involved someone who gambled excessively. Sometimes gambling is viewed as less serious than substance use because a person cannot overdose on gambling. This may be true, but there is one frightening aspect to a gambling addiction that we would not see with drug use. When people have an addiction to drugs, the effect of the drug can limit the usage. For example, if somebody gets high on a drug, they may stop using until the high wears off, and they may be incapacitated. With gambling, a person remains functional as they engage in the activity. Gambling doesn't prevent the person from gambling more. We don't see this decrease in their capability. This allows the person to operate at optimal manipulation levels in order to steal more money. So their potential criminal effectiveness is not impaired by continued gambling. Anthony gambled away almost $1 million at just one casino in Connecticut. How much would he have stolen if he could have? There was seemingly no limit to his destructive potential. The second and last item I want to talk about is the nature of being a victim of manipulation. The authorities doubted that Sarma was actually a victim of narcissism. They may be right. One of the difficulties about being a victim of narcissism is that it is difficult to prove. People targeted by a narcissist find themselves in a position similar to those who try to blame criminal behavior on mental disorders. There is no way to know for sure. This is an automatic benefit to the perpetrator and represents one more incentive for narcissistic manipulators to do their worst. They are able to shift the blame for their actions onto others without consequences. Those are my thoughts on the case of the bad vegan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be as intriguing as traveling throughout time to find the perfect conspirator. Thanks for watching.